I'm, I'm, I have focused on very um, easily accessible um, resources for this session. So you can easily go back and review what we've learned about today. So you can reinforce your knowledge rather than go for very rare or very complex um, literature or textbooks. So I focus on very uh, modern and easy way for you to revise what we learned today. Um, what we're going to focus on now is the thoracic terminology. And what that means is how you talk in thoracic imaging. This is something that's, uh, that comes with time. and But when you use this terminology accurately, you have already made the diagnosis before you even realize it. That's the good thing about learning the terminology. Just, just uh, in the beginning, when you are first opening a CT, just try to focus on finding the abnormality and describing the abnormality. Once you've done that, and even when you go back and read your own report, you can easily make a, a diagnosis or a reasonable differential diagnosis is the aim of learning the terminology. The terminology in chest is based um, still across the world based on the Freshner Society. So for those of you who don't know, the Freshner Society is a, is a group of um, specialized thoracic radiologists that got together about 19, late 1950s. Fleshner, Dr. Fleshner himself was, uh, I think, um, American or Austrian, Austrian American, something like that, European origin American. Um, who was the head of the society, and they com came up with a glossary or a dictionary of terms to describe an abnormality in lung. This is a late 1950s or early 1960s when the initial dictionary um, came out. And this is still in use. Around 2008, it was published um, with a revision, and this revision is still the last revision of it. It's still relevant, it's still accurate, still applicable. Um, that is what we use in the UK um, and America and across the world. Um, the revision that came out in 2008 was led by Professor Hansel. He, I was fortunate enough to work at the trust when uh, before he retired at the Brompton. So this this revision document of the Freshman Society, if you Google it or go to PubMed, it's it's um, not free. So you have to um, either buy the subscription or buy the article or depending on which university you work at or which trust you work at, you may have free access to it. Uh, there is, however, a website called Radiology Key that I will show you that has the terminology in it. Um, I'm pretty sure you can access it from anywhere in the world. Do try it and feedback if you can't. So I'll show you that website and we'll go um, <clears throat> look at the terminology there. It's alphabetical in order, so it's a bit haphazard. We'll be jumping through different areas of the lung of different kinds of terminology. Uh, somebody had asked a question about how do you differentiate between airway and interstitium, and this terminology will help address that. The airway or the sac of air or the SMS is the last structural unit of the lung. That's that's the, the bubble of the, the bunch of grapes or the grape. Um, that, uh, that is purely an airway, a conductive airway. So anything inside the asinus is exuded into the, uh, the asinus. Either you inhaled it, for, for, some, for you to inhale something or aspirate something and it to end up all the way in the distal airway is um, only possible if that structure is very, very small. And those structures are inhalational, occupational lung diseases. Um, most of the time, what fills up an asinus is infection or tumor or blood or fluid. And that is much more common uh, in the modern era than any inhalational structure, any inhalational substance in the asinus. So that's the thing to remember that that airway, that grape is the asinus. We don't use that term in describing, but it's it's good to remember it. <clears throat> uh, the acute interstitial pneumonia, I will not talk about it now because it'll be a bit too confusing for you. We'll come to it when we talk about the um, diffuse lung diseases session. Air bronchocam. The oldest sign, still one of the most important signs. Excuse me. Uh, describing an abnormality. Excuse me. Excuse me. We, you, uh, from where are you showing us? Uh, is it a website you are projecting? Because yes, it's a radiologykey.com. Yeah. Uh, I, I, we cannot see it. I, I can only see your PowerPoint slide, which is Flesher. You know the one yeah, on yeah, which Flesher shows. So stop and share it again. Share again. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, now we can see yes, it. Yes, air bronchogram and then air crescent. This is what the two words I'm seeing. Correct? 
Yes. Okay, please continue. Yeah. Yes. So maybe. <clears throat> Sorry. If there was anything okay. before air bronchogram, if you can show us that once again, because we did not see it. Was it wasn't an image. It was just no um, um, Tom. I was talking about. There was no image. Okay, that's the image was the AIP that I skipped to keep things uh, simple. Yeah. So moving on to the air bronchogram, uh, it's the the oldest sign and still one of the most important signs we use to differentiate um, benign from malignant or suspected malignant. What it means is that the airway leading uh, the the conductive airway leading into that sack of grapes is patent and the the consolidation or the infection or the tumor is sitting in the airways when there is something in the airways that is benign you get a positive air bronchogram so you can see lucencies or lines through that consolidation or that uh, that white area in the lung that white area may, may look like a triangle there may look like a mass it may look like a consolidation or it may be irregular whatever uh, the appearance of that white area if you see linear structures going through it that are branching that's a positive air bronchogram when it's a malignant pathology sitting in that airway or that part of the lung it doesn't respect any airway or structure it will cross anything so you will not get a positive air bronchogram when there is a malignant pathology it will eat anything it comes into contact with so that will get obliterated so when you see a positive air bronchogram it means that you have a benign pathology the other um so we like i said we're going in alphabetical order air crescent it's a slightly overused term in in enthusiastic registrar reporting uh, it's important to uh, realize before you call it something air crescent it is a very rare finding it is almost entirely in a cavity that has been uh, colonized by aspergillus or fungal infection in uh, immunocompetent people uh, it is almost impossible unless you've had isolated pathology or a cavity or surgery that gave you that long, dead space for fungus to grow uh, the crescent sign means there was a cavity that is slowly being filled up with a fungal ball there is still some air around it and that air is what you see like a moon or a crescent a thin moon uh, early moon or a young moon that is called a crescent sign um so when you when you call something as a positive crescent sign on x-ray you're basically saying that patient has a, a cavity with fungal ball in it so don't use that uh, terminology easily because it's a very specific diagnosis <clears throat> this one again uh, very overused air trapping is um, whenever we see that the lung parenchyma doesn't look as uniform as we would like it to be we are very quick to jump to conclusions and call it air trapping air trapping is a very common finding every um, it is common in the older population or people with um, hypersensitive airways but is it is also uh, re reasonably possible that the patient just has an expiratory scan or has contrast on the scan if you have a lot of contrast in you and a very early phase of uh, enhancement in the lung um, in a thin patient specifically you can get that appearance without there being air trapping so the the term is uh, overused and it's overused because people think well it's very likely somebody has had you know airways disease they have a bit of asthma so they just go ahead and call it the thing to remember with air trapping is you just don't just want heterogeneous lung parenchyma you want clear clear difference between two parts of the lung so this somebody would say uh, is a bit heterogeneous it isn't in in your first glance but if you look closely and you keep thinking about it in the and you do an expiratory scan that is a bit more exacerbated so what we do with suspected air trapping or anybody with the initial um, suspected presentation of interstitial lung disease or assessment of type of interstitial lung disease it is common to add on a, an expiratory scan that is precisely why we add the expiratory scan is when we want to see um, does that um, 
heterogeneous appearance get worse when the patient breathes out so because when they breathe out the part of the lung that traps the air keeps trapping the air while the rest of the lung expires out so that difference will get much more exacerbated than expiratory scan and be a bit more um, stark the difference will be normal and abnormal so it uh, that's called air trapping what we say we don't say the right base of the lung uh, shows air trapping we would say that the right uh, base of the lung shows a heterogeneous appearance that is exacerbated on expiratory scan if there isn't an expiratory scan you would say i would this should ideally be confirmed with an expiratory scan for suspected air trapping <clears throat> ap window is the term we use in chest radiographs and is only to describe when we think something is abnormal so the ap window is a normal space like i said the highest point is the posterior uh, top of the the arch of aorta before it comes down that's where the pulmonary artery sits it comes out like that that space is called the ap window um when there is lymphadenopathy again this is all dependent on a good projection good quality radiograph you see something sitting there you would say that the ap window is obliterated um you can also use that term on a ct although it's more commonly used on um x ray epical cap is a very conservative way of describing epical thickening we are uh, we should be moving away from saying that but um, the older more senior generation still describes chest radiograph as lateral epical caps because it's it's a non definitive non specific way of describing just haziness in the apex so it's um it's commonly seen it's commonly described but over time you should be using more specific terms like pleural thickening or um apical scarring something more specific rather than apical cap because you can easily get a query back from the referrer saying i don't know what a cap is architectural distortion is a very good term to learn is a very user friendly term because it can fit anywhere and is very helpful to describe when you're trying to convey that the lung is getting messed up what we see in a lung like i said airways get filled up with stuff what happens in a normal consolidation or um any inflammatory pathology is the lung tries to heal itself how extensive the pathology is will define in addition to the patient fitness is how well they will recover the ideal scenario is somebody will recover fully and the lung will look like nothing ever happened in real life if somebody has significant pathology on ct the lung will never go back to the way it was especially in older people uh, in in most of the cases it is okay um and it is clearly um, definable that this is post inflammatory sometimes what you will get like in this picture is you get a bit of nodularity and if this is the first ct and you're a junior registrar you're thinking is that a tumor is that consolidation is that infection if you had a previous ct that showed widespread extensive consolidation bilaterally you know this is something that's getting better but if this is the first ct what do you do with it uh it's okay to sit on the fence sometimes but over time you should be learning how the lung looks when it's um not acute so this type of finding doesn't happen in a day this type of appearance of the lung doesn't happen in a day what happens in a day is diffuse abnormality uh, abnormality sitting in it what happens over time when the lung heals is the lung heals on its own within itself uh what architectural distortion means is you're not saying fibrosis but you are saying fibrosis without committing to saying fibrosis that's why i think it's a very good term for you to use to learn you are able to convey uh, the significance of the appearance if somebody doesn't know how to look at images or doesn't have access to images reading your report should explain to them that the lung is doing something it's trying to heal itself or in the process trying to damage itself this happens in acute pneumonias it happens in hemorrhage it happens in trauma it happens in ards is over time um the consolidation kind of evolves and how it evolves with, within um a few months or even years is it twists and that is what architectural distortion means is that the lung is healing but pulling and pulling the minute you say pulling you think i have to say fibrosis but fibrosis by definition is permanent uh 
So without committing to the word permanent, because you never know, the patient might be lucky and this gets so much better in a year. So you're saying that there is few foci of consolidation, but there is extensive architectural distortion. That means that the lung is twisting and turning and trying to heal and pull and, you know, that's the kind of um, message you're sending across that there is an active process going on or the lung isn't um, as compliant. So if the patient's lung functions are abnormal, the architectural distortion is the explanation. <clears throat> Atelectasis is a very benign term. It just means volume loss. It can be for any reason, uh, as simple as being obese to as simple as not having good breathing practices. So it just means volume loss for any reason or without a reason, post-inflammatory, post-traumatic, um, or like I said, what used to be conservatively called uh, Windermere syndrome. So that's what atelectasis means. Anytime you see um, volume loss, you ideally want to rule out a proximal obstructing lesion. So atelectasis is most commonly benign. In the rare instance, what you will get is somebody put in a referral and say there is extensive, there is persistent atelectasis. Is there a proximal obstructing lesion? What they are saying is, is there something in the bronchus medially or outside the bronchus medially pushing on it, preventing air from going into that lung? What these patients should ideally get if somebody has um, um, significant atelectasis or volume loss in a smoker specifically is they should be getting a contrast scan. And what you're looking for is um, a small enhancing lesion somewhere there pressing on the bronchus. So uh, in atelectasis, you don't always see air bronchogram. And that's where the indeterminate bit comes from. That's why you should ideally rule out a medial uh, obstructing lesion. That's what the zygous is, uh, is 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 when I described it. Um, so I don't think we need to go into it again. Um, <clears throat> septal thickening. This again is very common, especially in the inpatient setting. Uh, before I go into septal thickening, I will pause for a few. Uh, uh, we lost your voice. Were you when when you said I will pause for something, then we lost your voice. Uh, I, I was saying, if uh, are there any questions, and somebody has. A Asked is architectural distortion for CT and X-ray? Yes, it is for any modality that you see lungs on. Uh, please can you explain the difference between air crescent and monad sign? I would highly recommend you stay away from the monad sign. It's when I when I say signs, when I I mean um, don't dig a dig grave for yourself because when you use these signs, you kind of tempting the examiner to. Um, ask you more and more and they will catch you somewhere. So the least amount of um, conservative specific terminology is advisable in exams. That's why it's, it's important to move away from um, specific signs and signs that have been named after the names of um, specific doctors um, over in the, in the new era, we're supposed to move away from it. And this is all to do with the the post-colonial, the new age, that the, the signs and symptoms shouldn't be based on certain individual's names. And we should move on to the, the pathology and the description of it rather than the specific people who discovered it. Collapse and atelectasis is the same thing. It is um, technically the same thing, but collapse is caused with some caused by something. Atelectasis is the word you use when you're trying to say, don't worry about it. When you're trying to... Um, cell pathology you use the word collapse and collapse you when you say collapse you want to say partial or partial low bar collapse or you know low bar collapse atelectasis can be a line or a little streak and that's technically post you just say linear opacity likely post inflammatory atelectasis interstitial alveolar disease i will come lower down and i will explain it to you uh, how is low dose CT chest done. I will come to that when we come to the pathology, although that is a radiographer question than a radiologist question. Um, so moving on to the septal thickening. Septal thickening, uh, there are two kinds of septa in the lung. You have interlobular septal thickening and interlobar septal thickening. So the lobules of the lung 
are outlined with interstitium. If you think back to the diagram that I showed you, that interstitium has lymphatics and vessels in it and a bit of um, fibrous tissue, normal connective holding fibrous tissue. Any of those um, structures, if they accumulate stuff and what they will accumulate uh, is uh, blood, fluid, cancer. That's about it. So, and fibrosis. Um, these things will accumulate in those structures and will give you septal thickening. <clears throat> septal thickening is um, easily appreciable on CT. It is not, not that easily appreciable on X-ray unless it's significant and the patient is in heart failure and you get those typical curly B lines. But on CT, it's pretty easy to pick. And why it's easy to pick is because you don't see the septa normally in the lung. You see them when they're abnormal. So you will notice them when they're there. And if you can see them, it's abnormal. Um, in heart failure or fibrosis, the, the, the more common types of fibrosis, it starts at the lung bases or it's at the worst at the lung bases. So that's where you will see it in an unwell patient or a heart failure patient or an inpatient or an ITU patient is that kind of uh, thickening. Uh, when somebody was asking consolidation collapse, if you have, see a big line going all the way across, that line would be atelectasis because there's no fissure or um, septa that crosses multiple lobules of the lung. When you see outline of a lobule, that is septa and that septa is thickened and you don't get um, fibrous septal thickening overnight or over weeks. It takes months to years. So if the patient was okay a month ago or a year ago, the only thing that can be is um, fluid or <clears throat> blood. And if you have um, blood in your septa, you're very unwell. So it's very hard to have. And how you get blood in the septa, you at that point, you already have blood in the alveolus as well. So this is all, if this was blood, this would be ground glass. And you would have ground glass all around and with lines through it. And that would be a hemorrhagic. When it's like this, and it's worse at the lung bases or more prominent at the lung bases, and the heart is big and they have coronary calcium, you start thinking now the fluid overload. Or if it's a post-trauma patient, even a young patient, and they have had very enthusiastic resuscitation, that will have that same appearance, and that's just a bit of extra fluid that, that will they will um, get rid of in a few days. So very common finding. Uh, septal thickening. When you come to septal thickening, you, the the more common septal thickening is the smooth septal thickening. That's the benign septal thickening. So that's the blood and the lymphatic channels going in the septa. The other thing going in the septa uh, is the fibrous tissue, which we covered, which will always be smooth. Uh, the 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 sinister pathology that runs in the septa is the lymphatics, and that's where some uh, malignancies can spread to. Those malignancies give irregular or nodular septal thickening. That is a advanced finding. That is a very specific finding for only a few tumors that cause that. Again, that's something for you to look up, which few tumors give you nodular septal thickening, breast being the most common culprit of that. When you um, say nodular septal thickening, you are saying cancer and nothing else. So again, a big give on the CT because that is a um, very advanced stage of cancer for somebody to get that, that's lymphangitis carcinomatosis. Um, and it won't be in somebody who hasn't um, had breast cancer or has breast cancer or has any sort of those three or four cancers that cause it visible on the scan or had previous imaging showing that. Uh, it's very um, extremely rare to present with lymphangitis carcinomatosis unless you've been tumor free for 10 years, which breast cancer patients can be and present um, with malignant um, metastatic disease years after. <clears throat> BLEB is again a, uh, something used when you are trying to describe a cyst or a space. BLEB is completely a, a benign uh, pathology. It is just a cyst. The dif difference between a BLEB and a bulla is only the size. They are uh, cysts in the lung, in the periphery. They can be in the center, but they're usually in the periphery. Um, they are either less than one centimeter or more than seven centimeter. Other than that, there is no difference uh, histologically between a bleb and a bulla. Uh, 
blab normal people can get um bulla and they can pop a blab and not notice it so it's it's completely a benign finding uh, some people don't define it or describe it on a ct uh, bulla is much more significant because you get that in um, smokers and asthmatics uh, copd patients and when those uh, spontaneous bulla spontaneously um, pop you can get a pneumothorax um, if you present with the pneumothorax you do not get imaging to identify uh, cross sectional imaging to identify the cause you have to have repeated uh, pneumothorax to be investigated to look for underlying bulla or structural cause of that is the uk guidelines bronchiectasis again very common term most of you know it all it means is dilatation of um, bronchuses the thing to really remember is bronchiectasis is a permanent dilatation it is not temporary it is uh, irreversible it is a uh, it is a permanent diagnosis you're giving a patient there are legal implications there are health insurance implications people can claim long term illnesses benefits all that um, a sort of um, implication that you have to think about longer term in a real life practice so really really shy away from giving bronchiectasis unless you're sure uh, it is very common to overcall bronchiectasis uh, in the last 10 cities that somebody has sent me or a junior doctors have sent me calling bronchiectasis i've kept one and um, disregarded the other nine that's how and that's on a routine basis so bronchiectasis is non tapering permanent dilatation of bronchi it is uh, common to have dilated bronchi during infection and the reason you can get that is because they have an infection and the lung around it is white when something around it is white it's um very um easy to notice anything going through it so they become more prominent it's not that they are more dilated they're just more prominent there because there is consolidation around it so what you're looking for is non tapering bronchi in a region that the lung around it is normal so there is no other cause for it so bronchiectasis by definition means uh, primary bronchiectasis you are saying that the bronchi are damaged or there's something wrong with the bronchi uh, what traction bronchiectasis used to be called and is now supposed to be called traction bronchial dilatation means that there is something around the bronchi that is pulling it so there are two different things bronchiectasis is primary airway disease and it is irreversible so uh, don't overcall it is the message um bronchial is not really a ct term um as we just say airways so you don't have to focus too much about it bronchial lectasis is an important term to remember especially if you're reporting hrcts or hoping to or starting a chest block or uh, routinely having to report hrcts during your on calls bronchial lectasis is uh, routinely confused with honeycombing and the reason I, of that is they both sit right at the border of the lung so bronchiectasis is permanent dilatation bronchial lectasis is also permanent dilatation but is bronchial lectasis is the end bronchi and it is usually caused by something around it what we do when we get interstitial lung disease is look for honeycombing and the reason we look for honeycombing or um, lucencies cysts surrounded cysts sitting there is it drastically changes the treatment options for the uh, the patient because it drastically changes the diagnosis it gives you a definite diagnosis of definite uip and there is no coming back from that because it's technically irreversible when people have definite uip patterns the pattern of fibrosis from that point on does not change so they have um depending on the stage they may be offered that treatment which is very expensive and very limited in availability even in uk certain centers have it uh, so you have to fit a very strict criteria to be offered that fibrotic uh, anti fibrotic um, treatment so you you're looking for honeycombing if you're reporting an ild scan so if you see cysts there that's why the traditional concept of looking for cysts that are stacking on top of each other so this bronch uh, bronchial if you looked scrolling down this is not going in the plane of your ct it's a no, it's a patient in three dimension so imagine it going up and coming down so on a certain slice you may see only one fraction of this and if that fraction happens to be there 
you could think that this is a cyst sitting on the right at the edge of the lung. So this is honeycombing. So uh, very routinely you will see, or if you attend ILD MDTs, you will notice radiologists saying there is no definite honeycombing. What you see as cyst is likely bronchial lectasis. We are saying that this is just a bronchi dilated all the way to the end because there is fibrosis around pulling it rather than this be a honeycombing. What is honeycombing? Honeycombing is end stage fibrotic disease. It is what used to be normal lung and it is now fibrosed finished lung. And that is um, now come completely fibrous compressed around what is now a cyst. And those cysts sit right at the edge of the lung. And that edge can be laterally, that edge can be medially. Sometimes it can only be next to a fissure because it's at still peripheral. Um, and that honeycombing, for you to confidently call it, if you're not a chest radiologist, look for it to stack on top of each other. So if there are multiple lucencies, one on top of the other in one slice, you can be confident that this is not bronchial lectasis, this is honeycombing. What is bronchiolitis? Bronchiolitis is an inflammation. It's a medical diagnosis. Uh, somebody, uh, the requests usually say bronchiolitis, question mark. What they're asking you to do is to look at the, the CT and uh, answer the question. Is there any sequelae of the bronchi bronchiolitis? <clears throat> so bronchiolitis is just an inflammation. What happens in inflammation of airways that the walls get thickened? They get thickened, they soft tissue attenuation, uh, and that's in a smoker, that's normal. It's not normal, but it's common and it's expected. And COPD, so COPD, that's common. If it's, an, if it's a normal patient who was acutely unwell, had a viral infection and you scan them, they would have transient bronchiolitis. If you have an atypical infection, uh, a mycobacterium, or if you have certain um, rheumatological diseases like RA, they can give you primary airway pathology. So these are autoimmune diseases that cause your airway walls to be very, um, um, it, not irritant, but they're kind of fighting themselves. It's autoimmune disease, the muscle and the, the soft tissue in the walls um, kind of um, hypertrophies or thickens. So they cause um, bronchiolitis, it's chronic inflammation. What happens is the lung around it gets inflamed because that airway is constantly chronically inflamed. So the lung beyond it, the airway beyond it will get secondary infection or inflammation. And they look like um, train bud nodules or central lobular nodules. And that's when you usually say um, bilateral airway thickening. This is surrounded by central lobular nodules or if those nodules look like uh, like not like like broccoli sitting on that bronchus that's when you call um, a tree in bud if they're isolated nodules dot dot dots around a thickened bronchus in the middle you would say surrounded by central lobular nodules suggestive of atypical infection what is a bronchus seal a bronchus seal is just a bronchus that is dilated and filled with junk that junk is usually mucus fluid if that fluid sits in there for a long time it gets thickened and thickened and can even calcify that calcification is coarse or dot or, or speculated uh, what it can look like on even on a chest x-ray um, if it's not entirely in plane is a nodule and when you ct them that nodule is actually a branching structure it's either you can connect it all the way into a bronchus it's a long tube filled with fluid or high attenuation material or it's a y that the 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 two limbs join and becomes an airway so you, you know it's an airway that got dilated it got infected it got filled with mucus and that's a bronchocele there is no reason to bron uh, follow up a bronchocele so if you're confident it's a bronchocele you don't have to follow it up the only reason you would follow it up is if it was an isolated bronchocele and it was persistent and uh, the patient had some symptoms and the symptoms most um, sinister in this context are hemoptysis. So very rarely you can get endobronchial tumors and those tumors are almost always carcinoids. So proximal carcinoids can obstruct because they are entirely endobronchial, they obstruct or block that bronchus and the distal bronchus fills up with secretions and fluid and give, gives you a bronchosteel. On a non-contrast CT, you won't see that carcinoid. Um, you may not see that carcinoid on a contrast enhanced CT as well, depending on the phase of contrast enhancement. Um, so 
because they're not indolent but very slow growing it's it's a blessing because um, they do get missed um, but they can come back years after and they haven't really grown that much so that's the the good thing about them they have a very good um, response to treatment as well uh, broncocentric again a very um, good term to remember and use it makes the report sound very professional and that that you have looked at where the pathology is and you're trying to isolate where it is what it basically means is that you're trying to say that it's benign because you're saying it's growing along the bronchovascular bundle so you're not uh, committing to peribronchial or perivascular because the bronchus and the vascular are right next to each other anyway there is a bronchus is a vessel next to it so rather than and you can't visually see the two differently anyway on ct so and if you don't know what the, um, the referrer is looking for of course if the question is um query sarcoid or they have uh, high ace levels then you know you're going to describe sarcoid then you can use more specific terms if it's uh, if it's unknown history or if it's a case that's been put in front of you in a viva and you want to describe it you wouldn't commit to perivascular or peribronchial what you you will say is it's peribronchovascular it's extending along the peribronchovascular bundles if it's consolidation looking so it's mass like looking or it's infective looking but it's going around the bronchi then you say it's broncocentric what you're saying is it's going uh, it's it's almost it's bulky looking it's not something i would ignore but it's going along the bronchocentric it's very specific infections like row like that a uh, very specific pathology like that goes like that um and organizing pneumonia is one of them so uh, organizing pneumonia is consolidation that sits along the um, it sits around the um, it's bronchocentric as well as peripheral organizing pneumonia is not an infection it's an inflammatory process that looks like infection it can completely resolve it can relapse it can even be chronic and give you fibrosis and chronic ild um very rare to see kaposi sarcoma in this day and age it happens in um, almost entirely with an aids an extreme immunodeficiency now it's a very specific tumor that goes along the uh, the bronchus distribution it is a rare diagnosis so you would hardly ever make it on ct unless it was a aids patient so it's it's good to remember it as a differential in the exam but not to give it as the first or second or third so what you say is it would it's um nodular looking consolidation that is broncocentric in distribution there is nodularity for this specific image i would say there is nodularity around it and even the fissures appear nodular in my top differential in this case would be a sarcoidosis if there was no nodularity it was bond or consolidation going around this bronchus and this bronchus i would put it as organizing pneumonia as number 1 so broncolith uh, is not a term we use it's not a term i would advise you to use it's just a term that means there is a calcified thing within the bronchus it's the equivalent of appendicolith appendicolith when you say you're essentially saying appendicitis bronchiolith on the other hand when you say you're not really saying anything it just means it's uh, something in the bronchus i don't know what it is it's a bit calcified so you can be assured that it is not cancer and then some smart respiratory consultant will say well it can be a calcified carcinoid can't it and they are right that is the only thing it can be uh, if it was not benign bulla like i said is just a bleb that is bigger than 1 cm um the most common scenario you will have is you will be looking at the scan and think is this a pneumothorax or is this a bulla it happens a lot more commonly than you would think it happens to everyone no matter how experienced we are it's usually when somebody has had an pneumothorax they have a follow up scan and you think is this the uh, is this a bulla that will give them pneumothorax or is this the pneumothorax the way to look at it is to look at the lung around it so the lung around a pneumothorax doesn't get lifted like that you don't see this clear um, compressed bit around it 
you will see some thickening or strandiness around it, like this hair that tells you this was once lung. Uh, a pneumothorax should have very clear margins around it. There should be absolutely nothing on the lateral or inferior part of it that looks even a bit like lung because the worst thing you want to do is put a drain in a bulla. And the likelihood of some be somebody being symptomatic with that bulla, um, unlike a pneumothorax, is very low. Uh, cavity again, these are distinctions that are very important to make on CT because what you say on the report determines what a patient gets and a wrong call can give patient a life-threatening complication. Uh, cavity is one of the most important ones in that because what happens is people can call that an infective, uh, infective collection slash empyema sitting next to the lung where it was actually a cavity in the lung. If somebody drained a cavity in the lung, it is a very bad outcome for the patient. And it is entirely the radiologist's fault that happened because they couldn't pick that the abnormality was actually inside the lung. Again, this is something that can confuse a lot of people. And the more you look at it, the more confused you get. If you are not sure that this is an empyema, don't rush. You can wait to get an expert opinion. What you can other the other thing you can do is you can do a delayed phase scan. If something was a delay um, within the lung, you would see a bit more contrast around it. The lung around it would show up a bit more clearly. And you would the most important bit is if you do a 60 second delay CT, you will see the normal pleura enhancing a bit more around it and be able to differentiate that this is not actually an empyema. Again. Um, just to reiterate, be very careful calling a cavity uh, an infective empyema because the consequences are too dire. Central lobular, a term very commonly used, um, is just a distribution. And they're just saying that something is sitting uh, in, uh, centered on the bronchovascular core of the secondary pulmonary nobule. It is implying that the, it is implying that the lesion is inflammatory and that it is benign. Having central lobular abnormality, that is cancer, is almost not possible. When you say central lobular, you're either saying that the patient is a smoker or you're saying that they have an infection or they have some sort of hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, something benign and inflammatory. Uh, central lobular is also a distribution for emphysema. How we differentiate central lobular from other distribution is you look at the periphery of the lung. If something doesn't go, if there are nodules here and then they don't go all the way to the periphery, they would be central lobular. Central lobular nodules stop all the way around. They don't ever go up to the pleural surface because they cannot, or up to the uh, fissure, or up to the mediastinum. Same with central lobular emphysema. It's a bit different for emphysema because people usually have a combination. They don't always have central lobular emphysema and parasite. They usually have a combination of um, emphysema patterns. So with central lobular, with emphysema, you just pick the pattern that is the most predominant. And there is uh, no right or wrong in that sense because you're not really causing any um, harm to the patient there. Consolidation just means the replacement of airways with other stuff. Other stuff can also be cancer. That is the one thing um, I remind people again and again. Just because it's consolidation doesn't mean it is not malignant consolidation. It is a, a rare um, appearance of lung cancer, but lung cancer can also look like persistent consolidation. That is... The only reason we follow up consolidation is we want to see it resolve. If it doesn't resolve, um, it's persistent. You have to think alongside the lines of cancer. If it resolves and comes back and resolves and comes back, you have to think along the lines of organizing pneumonia. Crazy paving. Uh, it's a term people like to use because I think it sounds very cool because um, they, they've learned it very recently, but it's a very specific, um, uh, historically very specific diagnosis that they're calling. The good thing about crazy paving is when it was uh, initially starting to come into use, you said crazy paving, you were saying alveolar proteinosis. Over time, we have realized that crazy paving can cause by other stuff as well, and that is actually your... Um, grace that you can say that and we can say the oh the registrar meant this crazy paving just means if you look at your pavements or your sidewalks in a in a park that pattern of the 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 rocky tiles are lines irregular lines and a bit of stone that's what you're looking at 
so that's what it just looks like a pavement in a in a in a rocky pathway in a in a garden or a driveway so the lines are the septal thickening and the ground glass is uh, is the air space so this person has air space abnormality and the septal interstitial abnormality so the very few things that can cause that so there is something that filled up the airway to the point that it got so full it started leaking it leaked into the interstitium interstitium uh, tried to hold it hold it by getting thickened and eventually it couldn't and it leaked into the pleural space and that sequence of events is most common in heart failure or in very acute presentations of heart failure or acute presentations of acute interstitial pneumonia that just means they have pneumonia and they have interstitial changes and we don't know why they why the lung is doing that it is um it is a um functional diagnosis or a presentation diagnosis rather than a pathological diagnosis aip just means the lung has gone berserk it's behaving um all sorts of crazy ways and we don't know what's happening in most patients what ends up happening is we watch them and we support them in itu and the patient eventually comes out of that episode uh, and that is and they usually do well if they on follow up on those patients with acute pneumonias you get uh, architectural distortion is the lung is healing itself then you do yearly follow ups depending on how they are symptomatically that distortion can either resolve or they can have a relapse of their pneumonia there is no way of predicting outcome dr khan do you think there is uh, there is only 8 minutes left do you think we should um, stop there and do a bit of vibe out uh entirely up to you uh, uh, so what what is the what is left uh i i have a couple of more signs that i think are important rest i think we can no let's, uh, let's continue with the signs and um, so so the uh, uh ground glass you all know um ground glass in the era of covid has become a very commonly used scenario and previously used to mean viral infections now it means covid or could be covid um it's becoming a part of our lives unfortunately ground glass just means there is something on the lung that looks like it's stuck on the lung that if you clean it it would go away so by definition ground glass means that you could see the lung behind it it's like a veil coming over the lung it can evolve into consolidation or it can completely resolve again no way of knowing looking at the scan how that patient will um evolve uh the last two signs i want to focus on is the halo sign and the reverse halo sign they are very specific signs they are very easy to pick up they are very uh, pretty looking um and when you say those signs you are saying a certain differential diagnosis so halo just means there is a halo around it like a halo around an angel is there is a lesion in the lung and it's glowing basically there is ground glass all around it there are very few lesions that cause a uh, few pathologies that cause it and unfortunately the same pathologies many of the same pathologies called a reverse halo sign as well so the reverse halo means the ground glass is in the middle and the consolidation is centered or a circle of dense tissue around it uh the the pathologies that are associated with it is most commonly uh, hemorrhagic lesions vasculitis fungal infections so rare and um, wonderful pathology like that honeycombing we've already covered uh, uip will cover in the fibrosis section septal thickening we've also covered mm. yeah that's about it i will go back to the vibe a bit and do a couple before we go as you were uh, putting up the viva slides uh, this is for the audience please remember they are going to be dedicated sessions uh, for for example interstitial lung disease and many of the questions which have been put just wait for the, those sessions where they will be answered in more detail over to you some of you okay so this one is i'm pretty sure is pretty simple most of you will pick that this is ground glass that i'm showing you uh and this is uh, i think in case of covid this one is what i want you guys to tell me what this is showing where the arrows so this is a 30 second slide so i hope you uh, okay so crazy reverse hello crazy
लास्ट टेन सेकेंड्स प्लीज वो टू यू yeah so if you notice where the arrow is you see that there is ground glass and you see uh, thin uh, lines going through that area you can see the the lines of the septal thickening more prominently elsewhere but even in that specific spot you see lines and ground glass so that is indeed gravy paving this is actually a case of ild but that specific area that i'm showing you is a focal um, appearance of k is crazy paving so a oh, well done farheen and hamid um next one is this one if you just tell me what the this part where my mouse is is showing you so 30 second once again please can you put the mouse again please yeah yeah so 10 seconds over to you okay so well done this is uh, consolidation because you can see these dots going all the way through it it's positive air bronch gram uh, somebody has put in op but if you notice the consolidation is posterior and it's dependent and that is not a pattern you see in op op you want to see peripheral and uh, peribronchial um this is ground glass and this is consolidation and this is uh, i think a case of ards and this one 30 seconds and my my follow up question to this is is can this be cancer last 10 seconds over to you please yes so that patient with that if that is consolidation and that cavity sitting in there is indeed in the lung so this is a cavity and that patient should be very unwell this is patient walked in to get that ct this has to be very suspicious for cancer because you don't get that thick walled cavity and uh, cavitating lung cancer is is not that uncommon um so this is a cavity in a unwell patient this would be consolidation with secondary cavitation or in a reasonably well ambulatory patient it would be suspicious for cancer this one just tell me the um describe it to me the some of the the terms you would use in this one it could be consolidation uh, use more than one so now we begin with 30 seconds last 10 seconds over to you please yeah so this slide shows quite a few uh, terminology signs you could use ground glass yes mosaic yes because mosaic is essentially meaning um just that there is a difference in attenuation a bit of ground glass a bit of dark i can't tell whether the dark lung is too dark or the ground glass is too white but the lung is heterogeneous so yes there is um, a mosaic attenuation but what is important about this ground glass it is nodular there is a texture to it it's like if you touched it you could have a, um, a texture in your hand and that means that it is nodular looking ground glass and when there is texture to ground glass that nodule is almost always in the central lobular distribution so you have central lobular nodularity on the left you have mosaicism you have ground glass so those terminologies you put on a piece of paper yes exactly so you have hypersensitivity pneumonitis very good khola jahan se and i think this is the last one no so uh, your question please what, what do they want what do you uh, want i i would like to uh, tell me what this distribution is so we begin now and this is just to confuse you remember that
last 10 seconds. Over to you, please. Okay, very good. It's very good. Almost none of you got confused. This is indeed all diffuse ground glass with a few lines in it that you can't explain away as vessels. So this is superimposed septal thickening onto a ground glass. Um, and that is, yes, it could be pulmonary edema, but this specifically histologically is alveolar uh, peritonosis. But that's, yes, I agree. That's a very good differential. Pulmonary edema definitely would be in there if this patient was uh, an acutely unwell patient. And because alveolar proteinosis is known to have a patient that looks like me and you, they would be completely normal walk in and have a horrible looking CT. If this patient was unwell though, uh, alveolar uh, pulmonary edema doesn't look this pretty. What you do get is dependent consolidation, a bit of fluid, the heart is too big. It's a messier looking picture in pulmonary edema. I, okay, this sign should be straightforward. So 20 seconds, please. The slide, I believe, has shifted. Can yes. Yeah. Yeah. But yes. everybody, yeah, right. this is um, reverse halo, very straightforward. Yeah. Uh, reverse halo sign. Indeed, it's ground glass in the center surrounded by dense consolidation level, soft tissue level looking uh, intensity around it. So that's a reverse halo sign positive in, in this patient. Um, this one. It's just to show you, and the for the purpose of time, is to show you um, this. There are two things I'm showing you, both to do with that arrow. So there is bronchiectasis, yes, exactly, Dr. Mahesh, perfect. So that's bronchiectasis and there is bronchial wall thickening. Bronchiectasis just means dilatation. When the wall is thickened, you also have to mention that because that means chronic inflammation and possibly super added infection. So there is bronchiectasis and, and bronchial wall thickening. Uh, this is the last one and this was just for teaching purpose. This wasn't a viva. This was to show that there is a difference between mosaic attenuation and normal appearance. Uh, mosaic attenuation is this, which you all um, perfectly picked on the earlier slide. This is what normal lung looks like over age. And just to understand it, as we grow older, our lung is also tissue that gets less compliant. So over age, and there becomes this density. The top half of the lung is more loosened. The bottom gets, gets a slightly higher density, and you get these focal areas of low attenuation. That's a very uh, known uh, literature proven appearance of a normal old lung. Uh, I think that's my last slide. Some of the references you can go through. Uh, just to reiterate that a website was radiology key if you wanted to go through the terminology again. Um, and that's about it for me. Okay, so thank you very much.